We've built the genetic foundation for understanding evolution and the processes that drive it. Now we'll use that as a framework for understanding the evolution of a very specific group of mammals. And so we turn our attention to the study of our closest genetic relatives. In order to understand the evolution of the primates, we need to revisit what we've learned from evolutionary theory, which tells us that, one, life has a history, and that life has changed over time. This is documented in the fossil record, in the geological record, and in our DNA, which also tells us that we can trace our evolutionary history back to common ancestors. The process of evolution produces a pattern of relationships between species, and to help us organize these relationships, we use a taxonomy or classification system, which now we get to develop an appreciation for how this system works in categorizing living things based on similarities and differences. And as you know, the categories or taxons begin very broadly, and each level that you move down becomes more exclusive and tells us more about that group's adaptations to the environment, meaning a distinct set of adaptive traits that will be reflected in both their anatomy and behavior. By placing certain groups of species into particular taxonomic groupings, what we're really doing is making important biological statements about the genetic and evolutionary relationships between species. As you know, humans and all other primates belong to the taxonomic class of mammals, and this includes a diverse group of animals consisting of bats, rabbits, horses, whales, elephants, wolves, etc. Yet, we all share a distinctive set of traits or characteristics, including being warm-blooded, having hair or fur, giving birth to live young, nursing those young, breathing air, and relatively large brains in relation to body size. pattern of relationships produced by the evolutionary process is typically represented in a family tree or phylogeny, which helps us to understand the adaptations which are reflected in both anatomy, behavior, and most importantly at the genetic level. The evolution of the primates has to be placed in the larger context of the evolution of the mammals. And 160 million years ago, mammals were very different from those found today. One in particular is of interest to us, and it is a small, shrew-like creature that existed alongside the dinosaurs, although they occupied a very different environmental niche. Click on the audio file next to Jeremiah Sinensis to learn a little bit about this more recent discovery. This is from a recent article called Meet Your Newest Ancestor. A fossil of a shrew-like creature pushes back by 35 million years the day when mammals first nourish their young in the womb. Most humans think of the placenta as something that gets tossed out after childbirth. In fact, its appearance millions of years ago was a significant evolutionary development that gave rise to the vast majority of mammals alive today, from bats to whales to humans. Until now, scientists believe that placental mammals first appeared some 125 million years ago. At that point, they branched off from the lineage that developed into modern marsupials, which nourished their young in their pouches instead of through placentas. Yet a recent fossil find backdates that divergence by about 35 million years, showing that mammals with placentas, known as eutherians, shared the earth with dinosaurs much longer than previously thought. The fossil, described in the journal Nature, belongs to a tiny shrew-like creature known as Jeremiah sinensis that roamed China 160 million years ago. It appears to be the oldest known ancestor of placental mammals. 
Placental nourishment allows a more rapid and efficient transfer of nutrients from mother to offspring, which can result in faster brain development, larger mature brains, and increased metabolic rate, all of which have had broad implications for the evolution of the behavioral and social complexity observed among today's mammals. The Jeremiah fossil also yields important clues about the life of early eutherians. This animal appears to have been sectivore, judging from the shape of its teeth, and it had robust forelimbs, which could have helped it to climb trees. This ability may have enabled it to take over as yet unexploited territory for both safety from predators and access to insects among the foliage. Any opportunity to reduce competition with other Jurassic mammals by staking out higher ground may have helped strengthen Jeremiah's divergence from marsupials, leading it to become the ancestor of an extremely diverse group of mammals. This is exactly what we would expect, as natural selection does its job of keeping a species or population well adapted so relatively little change occurs in millions of years. But that period of stability, or equilibrium, came to an end around 65 million years ago, when an asteroid collided with the Earth and caused many species of plants and animals to die, including all of the dinosaurs, which were the dominant land animals on Earth at that time. It also caused major climate change, huge ecological disruptions, volcanic eruptions, loss of vegetation, and the removal of dominant land animals and many other species through mass extinction. In other words, there were very strong selective pressures operating for new forms to develop, the ingredients for speciation to occur. With the dinosaurs gone, mammals like Jeremiah had an opportunity to move out into areas and exploit new resources, and we call that process adaptive radiation the evolution and spreading out of related species into new environmental niches. So, in the few million years following the extinction of the dinosaurs, there was a rapid, relatively rapid, diversification of mammals, that is, a burst of evolutionary activity, a punctuated burst of evolutionary activity where we went from these tiny shrew-like creatures to animals with hooves, fangs, and flippers. It was around 60 million years ago that a distinct group of mammals appeared, the primates. So what exactly is a primate, and what sets primates apart from other mammals? The primate order is made up of close to 300 different species, so there's a lot of variation. So we've got everything from this teeny tiny mouse lemur, which you can see sitting in the palm of my hand, just how tiny it is, to the largest of all living primates, which is the gorilla. And we have just about every type and size of primate in between the two. So it's a very diverse and varied order. Yet, as a group, the primates share many characteristics and exhibit a set of evolutionary trends, which may or may not be equally exhibited in all primates, but together define a distinct primate way of life that reflect their adaptations to arboreal living. Let's begin with one of the important characteristics that distinguishes primates from other types of mammals, and that is that vision is their predominant sense. They rely more on vision than most of their other senses in taking in information not just about their physical landscape, but also about their social landscape. So vision is much more developed or acute in primates than in most other mammals. The heavy reliance on vision is reflected in enhancements to primate vision and the protection of these very important sense organs, the eyes. One of the important characteristics of primate vision is their forward-facing eyes, which produces a binocular field of vision. 
and the visual centers in the brain analyze information from this field to produce a three-dimensional picture. So the stereoscopic or 3D vision is really important for primates in order to be able to judge the distance and depth between branches as they're leaping and jumping around in the trees. So this is a skull of a monkey, and we can see this enhanced protection for the eyes by this ring of bone called the postorbital bar, which encloses the eye socket, and also by this plate of bone at the back of the eye socket called the postorbital plate. And these features are telling us that the skeletal structures are protecting this very important sense organ for this animal. So it's telling you sight and vision is really important, so those organs are well protected. Now, in contrast, you can see what the domestic cat skull looks like. And in the eye area, you can see, first of all, that the bone is unfused. That postorbital bar is unfused. It's not fused together and protecting that eye, nor is there the plate of bone at the back. So very uh, limited protection, in fact, no protection for the eyes because the cat relies less on their sense of sight than they do on their sense of smell. Color vision is another enhancement to primate vision, and except in the prosimian primates, which tend to be nocturnal, color vision enhances daytime activities, including locating a really important food source, which is ripe fruit, which tends to be brightly colored. Primates are among some of the most colorful mammals on the planet, so color vision also helps in distinguishing individual members within your home group and those of other groups. Primates also rely very heavily on vision for communication through the use of facial expressions or body gestures that communicate how one is feeling their emotional state. And this is very similar to the way that we also rely on facial expressions and body language, if you will, in order to assess other people's understandings or their reactions or their emotional states. Visual communication is also important for human primates as we've learned that human infants acquire their language capabilities primarily through visual means, that is, watching the facial expressions and the mouth as it's forming words and sounds. It's a visual process, and so primates and humans are dependent on those visual signals or communication. Primates also tend to rely less on their sense of smell, and this is reflected in their progressive shortening of the snout, that is, the region that's developed to support olfaction or the sense of smell. And this isn't to say that the sense of smell isn't important for primates. It certainly is. It helps them to locate their young, to detect food, and to avoid predators. However, it comparison to vision, there's not as much reliance on the sensory input from smell as compared to vision. So you can turn to the skeletal anatomy to really get a sense of the important features and the important sense organs that help the animal navigate its way through both the physical landscape and the social landscape, as you'll see. So this is a more primitive primate. This is a lemur. It's a prosimian. And in this primate, you see that it's got this long snout. So the snout is protruding, which is telling you, kind of like that tree shrew-like ancestor, that smell is still an important sense for this primate. Whereas in contrast, with a monkey, you can see that shortening of the of the snout area because they rely more on vision and less on their sense of smell. So there's less prognathism in the snout region as compared to primates or other mammals that rely more heavily on their sense of smell. Although all non-human primates are quadrupeds, there is great variation in the way that they use their limbs. There are some specialized forms of locomotion like we see here 
with the vertical leaping and clinging small-bodied primates who have more developed hind limbs for a very powerful springing action. And you can see this in the illustration of this tarsier that has very elongated hind limbs and shortened forelimbs. So those hind limbs give him a really strong, powerful leaping capability. Another specialized form of locomotion is brachiation. That's arm over arm swinging, suspended from branches. And that's exhibited by the small bodied ape, the gibbon. You can see he's got very long arms and really extremely flexible and mobile wrist joints and shortened legs. So the primary limbs used for locomotion by this brachiating ape are the arms. Now again, quadrupedalism is the primary form of locomotion, but it does take some different variations. You will find quadrupeds both on the ground, terrestrially, and also in the trees, arboreally. But other, more specialized forms of quadrupedalism include knuckle walking, which is generally done by the largest body primates, and these are the great apes. So chimpanzees and gorillas and even orangutans when they come down from the ground, which is very rare, um, have very powerfully built arms that are slightly longer than their legs, and they have to rest their weight on their knuckles to support their large body. They have really prominent muscle attachments on their forelimbs and on their scapula to help support that weight. So the the behavior is reflected in the anatomy. And most primates are also capable of bipedalism, although they can't sustain that form of locomotion for any great distance or duration of time. And it tends to appear in primarily opportunistic situations, like you see with this monkey running with his hands full carrying the bananas. In terms of dental anatomy, we can get a sense of the types of foods that an animal eats by looking at their dental patterns. And the primates have the ability to eat a wide variety of food, which is a huge evolutionary advantage. This is because they have generalized dentition, meaning they lack specialized teeth, and that translates into a lack of dietary specialization. So unlike herbivores, such as cows whose broad back teeth are designed for processing and chewing grass, or carnivores who have large canines and pointed sharp teeth and molars to shred and tear into flesh and meat. The non-human primates are mostly omnivorous. Their variety of teeth allow them to eat a variety of food, although their most favorite food would definitely be ripe fruit because that's a source of energy for them. But this means that if one food source is in short supply, they can turn to other foods. And that's, again, a very big advantage. But because there's so much variation in the primate order, we do see some dietary preferences in certain species. And their dental patterns are going to reflect their reliance on particular types of food. So you will see some variation in tooth structure. But overall, we do see generalized dentition, with an omnivorous dietary pattern. From a developmental perspective, the primates differ from a lot of other mammals as well. With respect to reproduction, all reproductive activity only occurs when the female is in estrus. Now this isn't unique to primates. This is the period during which females are most sexual re sexually receptive or fertile. So it ensures that uh, reproductive activity occurs during her most fertile period. But unlike a lot of other mammals, primates uh, have a long gestational period. And this is related to the fact that primate babies, the infant primates, have highly developed brains. So it takes them longer to develop or gestate during pregnancy. Primates tend to have usually single infant births. There are some species where the norm is uh, to have twins, but the vast majority of primates only have one baby at a time. And this is because there's a lot of parental investment that's involved in caring for a dependent primate. There is this prolonged infant dependency where the baby is totally dependent on its mother for nourishment, for transportation, and for protection. But as they move through distinct life stages, 
their behaviors and their activity patterns change throughout their lives, as well as the way that others interact with them. Primates also take longer than a lot of other mammals to reach sexual maturity, which means it, it takes them longer to reproduce. The aspects of primate reproduction that we just covered have consequences for their social behavior and organization, which is designed to enhance the reproductive success of the species. We'll be talking much more in depth about behavior and organization among the non-human primates in a future lecture, so for now it's enough just to point out that the primates, the vast majority of the species, tend to live in social groups. They're very highly social and incredibly intelligent. and being social has a lot of advantages for the survival of the species, but in all primate social groups, the foundation of that group is the mother-infant unit. This is the strongest and most enduring bond in the primate society. Because primates have to learn how to behave in pretty complex social groups, they have a greater dependency on learned behavior. They're not just pre-programmed knowing how to get along. It takes a primate a lot longer to acquire and learn the skills necessary for independence and to function and behave appropriately within a social group. Primates, like other animals, also rely on vocal communication, and especially living in such a dense forest environment. Vocalizations are helpful in broadcasting the whereabouts of individuals or group members, and also to communicate important information about the environment. Primates are also highly intelligent, and have been taught, at least, chimpanzees and gorillas to use but not speak a language and that language is American Sign Language. Of course all languages are symbolic. They're symbol systems where we use words to stand for something else. So the fact that the non-human primates have been taught to use the system of symbols indicates their high level of intelligence. However, they do not have the vocal apparatus that's required to be able to actually form words or speech. And we're also learning from genetics that there are a specific set of genes that are involved in producing spoken language. These FOXP2 genes, both chimps and humans have. However, they're activated in humans and not in chimps. So it makes you wonder, was there some epigenetic change or some mutation that activated or triggered these 42 genes in humans and not in the apes? Interestingly, 6% of Earth's land surface is tropical rainforest, yet it houses nearly half of all living species on Earth and 90% of primate species. Each species has evolved a distinct pattern of using space and feeding that avoids direct competition and conflict with other primates. Food preferences, foraging activities, and ranging patterns help primatologists identify how several primate species live together. In this visual, you can see the various layers or level of the forest that are occupied by the primates. So they're distributed throughout the forest regions. With over 300 different species of non-human primates, we have a lot to learn about this amazing group of animals, both about the primates on their own terms, but also about humans as members of the primate order. But unfortunately, so many primate groups are some of the most highly endangered animals on the planet, and they face a number of significant threats to their existence, including, and most importantly, the loss of habitat due to deforestation. Since the vast majority of primates live in trees, when those forests and trees are cut to make room for grazing or development, the primates lose their homes. And it's not as simple as one group that's lost its territory to move on over to the next patch of trees. 
Because primates are so territorial, they'll defend their resources and their ter territory very aggressively. So when the trees go, their homes go, and more often than not, they lose their lives as well. Primates also represent a food source for a lot of people around the world, so hunting for bushmeat can take a significant toll on primate populations. The removal or capture of wild animals from their homes through poaching is a significant problem, particularly in areas where people are very, very poor, and poaching is very lucrative. Many primates are captured for sale on the black market and sold as pets. Some are used for body parts as part of ethnomedical traditions and treatments and practices. And unfortunately, due to the very close genetic, anatomical, and biological similarities with humans, many primates are used in biomedical research and subjected to some very horrible experiments. Now we've learned that primates take a long time to reach sexual maturity, that is to be able to reproduce, and when they do, they only have one baby at a time. So the reproductive patterns of the primates make it very difficult for them to recover their populations as they start to lose members. So these are really significant threats, and interestingly, the biggest threat to the non-human primates are human primates.